Okay. 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 So this is the Amherst Board of Health, um, April 21st meeting. And pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of open meeting law, General Law 30, Section 20, this meeting of the Amherst Board of Health will be conducted via remote uh, means. For information on remote participation, please see the Board of Health agenda posted on the Town of Amherst website. No in-person attendance will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings via technological means. In the event that we are <coughs> unable to do so despite best effort, we will post on the Board of Health website an audio recording of the meeting as soon as possible. And with that, I will call the meeting to order and have a roll call. So in attendance, Stephen George. Here. Jennifer Hi. Brown. I'm oh, Jennifer Brown. I'm just going across the name. Sorry. Jen Brown is oh, uh, Lauren Mills. Here. Maureen Millay. Here. And Tim Randner. Here. And Nancy Gilbert. Here. Um, Jennifer Brown is the um, health director, and due to circumstances, she will not be actively present during today's meeting. She will be monitoring the participants. So the first order on the agenda is the minutes of the March 10th meeting. And does anyone have any comments? Corrections? No, I don't think so. Okay, if not, may I have a uh, motion to accept the minutes as presented? I'll move to accept the minutes from the March 10th meeting. And may I have it seconded? I'll second. Okay, Steve second. So I will have a vote. Um, Steve George? Aye. Lauren? Lauren? Aye. Minutes. Aye. Maureen? Thank aye. you. Tim? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Thank you. So next, we are going to move to our open hearing, the public hearing. This is a public hearing to discuss the recombinant DNA regulations for Amherst. The Amherst Board of Health is a five-member board that is appointed for a three-year term. The duty of the board is to promote and protect the public health of the residents of Amherst. The board derives its authority from the Massachusetts legislature. The members are Chair Nancy Gilbert, Stephen George, Maureen Millay, Lauren Mills, and Timothy Rander. Jennifer Brown is the director um, of the Amherst Health Department. She is an employee of Amherst whose duties are to carry out the wishes of the board and assist in the enforcement of our regulations and deal with the day-to-day -day operations of the health department. With the exception of Title V regulations, it's not legally required for the Board of Health to hold a public hearing on proposed regulations before them even though all proposed regulations are addressed at meetings to which the public is always invited. This meeting will be public. However, the board will not provide time for, for, for further public testimony unless a board member has specific questions to which the audience member can offer some clarification. After the public hearing, the board will accept written testimony for a period of 22 days until May 13th. Letters can be emailed, mailed, or delivered. The email is brownj at amherstma.gov or to Jennifer Brown at the Health Department, 70 Boltwood Walk, Amherst, Massachusetts, 01002. The board will vote on the final regulation at their June 9th meeting. 
If the proposed regulation is passed, the regulations will be posted at the health department office and, on, on, and online and will be publicized in summary form in the Hampshire Gazette within 30 days of passage. Before we begin taking testimony, and in the interest of time, we ask that you follow the following rules. Any person wishing to make comments will be allowed to speak. The host will unmute the speaker. At this time, please identify yourself and give your place of residence. Before addressing the Board of Health, please be familiar with the proposed changes to the regulation. When addressing the Board of Health, please state any professional affiliation you may have that impacts your comments. Identify the section of the proposal you wish to comment on. Please limit your comments to three minutes so that other members of the audience will have a chance to speak. As noted earlier, the written testimony will be accepted until April 30th and can be emailed to Jennifer Brown at brownj at amherstma.gov or mail to Jennifer Brown Health Department, 70 Boltwood Walk, Amherst, 01002. Thank you for your anticipated cooperation. May I have a motion to open the public hearing? So moved. Okay, Steve, may I have it seconded? I'll second that. Okay, Maureen, thank you. So it has been uh, moved and seconded and we have to vote on it. So Steve? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Lauren? Aye. Tim? Aye. And Nancy, aye. So the public hearing on the recombinant DNA regulations for Amherst is now open. Does anyone want to make any comments? Well, we have, uh, we have one person. Jen, can you open it? Sure. Yes. Um, I I just received an email from that person, and I believe they're not commenting on the DNA regulations, but I'm not 100%, so I'm going to call on them. So, Carol, Carol Gray, I'm going to allow you to talk. Um, this needs to be about the recombinant DNA regulations. If it's about another topic, we'll call on you soon, but not now. Okay, thank you. It, it's on the COVID regulations. And could you okay. tell me what, what time to come back? So on the agenda, it says, uh, let's see, 515. Okay, that's fine. Stay, I'll wait. Just stay here and I see, I see you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So we have five more minutes of public comment. If there's no other public comment on the um, recombinant DNA, would we just take the public comment that we have? Well, what we had, no, no, because this is a special hearing. So we have oh. to close the hearing and then open the meeting oh, again. Okay. So this is just the public hearing on the recombinant DNA. And then we will vote on it on our June 9th meeting, um, allowing people to write comments. And it had been posted um, uh, and the draft of the proposed regulations have been posted to meet all the legal considerations of the public hearing and the regulation. Did we get a final draft of the regulations? All the yeah, ordinance? it was sent out with with um all the oh, for this this meeting. It was sent out for this meeting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it was what um, um Steve and Maureen have been working on, and we've been discussing since yes, last yes. January. Yes. Make sure yeah. so this is the final. This is the final uh, 
draft and then in june we'll we'll vote on whether this is the new regulation we'll have um, due to the time commitments because people can submit um, written testimony if they so choose to so. steve or maureen you want to say anything while we're waiting sure. we'll just have to wait I don't know that there's more to say about it from uh, our discussions of the previous meetings. Um, yes, and I know that um, Jenna, Jennifer sent out notices to the, the three schools about them. So if nobody's come, I'm sure there's no um, comment and we'll just wait another minute and then we'll close the hearing. I think we can close it now because just sitting here. So may I have a motion to close the meeting? Okay, I'll move that also. Okay, may I have it seconded? I can second it. Okay, thank you, Tim. So it's been moved and seconded to close the meeting. Now we can vote on it. Tim? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Steve? Aye. Lauren? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Okay, so it's moved, seconded, and voted. So we've closed the hearing and there's been no public comment on the regulations and we'll vote on those in June. Okay, so now we will go to public comments. And um, according to uh, the guidelines for the act extending COVID-19 measures, June 16th, 2020, the open meeting law does not require that public bodies allow public comment or public participation during the meetings, um, but we can, um, choose to accept public comment and therefore the Amherst Board of Health will allow public comment using the following guidelines. Residents may make com public comments up to two minutes during this period. When called on, um, please state your name and your address. We'll be giving priority to Amherst residents than to others who do not reside in Amherst. To be acknowledged, commenters must have their names in their windows and the intention of the public comment period is for the Board of Health members to hear comments from the public, but not to engage in discussions or debate. And the chair has the right to deem commenters disruptive and will end their public comment period for any disruptions. And there, um, if there are any questions for the health director, she can be reached via email and her contact information is on the town website. So with that, we're gonna open public comments. And this is where Carol Gray has her hand up and- So yeah, Carol, Carol, welcome back. If you can state your full name and where you live, please. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Carol Gray, 815 Southeast Street, Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, thank you for letting me speak and thank you for your service to the town. Um, I am a parent of a high school student, and when the town imposed the mask mandate, I gave a huge sigh of relief because I had been really worried about my son going back to school, and I felt like as I watched the statistics across the country, I thought, well, my kid is safe. Everyone's masked. Um, the mask mandate got lifted, and our son was still fully masked at all times every time. And um, I let him participate in the musical. And I think it was probably one of the worst parenting decisions I've ever made because when they came out for the show, I saw that he was one of about three kids masked and about 50 kids on stage were not masked. And I sat there in the seat terrified thinking we've been so good for two years. And my husband's 70, he's higher risk. Um, and and I uh, and I thought, oh my God, 
he how he's not going to get through this without getting COVID. And unfortunately, I was right. So he came down with COVID. And so we had planned to have vacation plans to look at colleges out west and everything was canceled and we've all been quarantining. And thankfully, it seems he's gotten through COVID okay. He tested negative, but then he got a headache. And then I started reading that about 10% of kids, even those with minimal to no symptoms, will get long-term COVID and um, they could have it for six months. They could be completely debilitated by it. No headache today, so I'm hoping that's not our kid. Anyway, I'm asking you to please reimpose the mask mandate. I, um, I, I'm a, a fellow at the Humanities Institute at the University of Connecticut and UConn just imposed, reimposed their mask mandate for all classes in all workplaces, regardless of size uh, and for all indoor events exceeding a hundred individuals, but for everything, basically you, you, uh, and, and UConn has a fraction of the cases that UMass had. Uh, from the April 6 statistics, UConn has 44 cases, UMass has 109. Then I started looking at towns that are reinstituting the mask mandate. Uh, Darien in Connecticut, Darien, Greenwich, Norwalk, Reading, Stamford, Stratford, Stratford, Trumbull, Westport, in Massachusetts, Salem, Lowell, Boston, Belrica, Lynn, Revere, Newton, West Westboro, Philadelphia just reimposed. Um, I know of close to a dozen kids who came down with COVID because of that show. There's going to be another show coming up. I'm not going to let my son participate in it unless there's a mask mandate. Uh, but I'm really, and it's too late for our kid. You know, if he gets long-term COVID, well, there's nothing I can do about it at this point. But I thought I have a duty as a parent to come and ask you to save other kids because of those there's probably at least a couple dozen kids that came back down because of that musical. And who knows how many just in school, um, our kid tests every week. We've been doing, we've been so careful for two years, just put the mask mandate back into place until the end of the school year, please. Like any one of these kids can bring it home. My, 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 another fellow at my school, his kid brought home COVID and he emailed today to say he and his wife and the other kid, all have COVID. And he said, I have severe symptoms. You could be saving some kid's parents' life. You could be saving some kid from long-term COVID. Oh. It's, please, please. You're... Thank you. Thank, I'm done. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Carol. I'm sorry that you, your son got COVID. Um, any other comments during this public comment time? Um, I don't see any other hands. Okay. Well, thank you, Carol. And we will move on to our agenda. So old business, toxic chemical regulations, update, Tim and Lauren. Yeah, we had been working on a draft document and I, I believe a few weeks ago it was, uh, I think uh, Lauren was looking at it and so I think uh, uh, we're still working on it. That's the status of it. Okay. Um, yes, I, I've gathered a few articles that I'm, I'm reading through and also looking at the um, definition of neo neonic pesticides, which are chemi um, chemicals used in a lot of um, sprays that are water soluble and they um, mimic the effects of nicotine mm -hmm. on the nervous system. So I, it's kind of like a new you know, thing for me to understand, but um, I like the, the, the list that it gives of these um, particular chemicals that do get into the soil, that are sprayed on the soil and do get into the soil and could, you know, be a hazard for, for people and for um, certain important um, insects like bees. So I'm, I'm still gathering information that I would like to be specific in the regulation. 
Okay, the other resource that you could look at is the University of Massachusetts Extension Service. I have a name of a faculty member there who is her area of expertise is pesticides. So, uh, let me see, I had it here. Hmm. Uh, okay. oh, sorry, here it is. Um, pesticides, um, and Natalia Clifton. And she is, has lots of information about pesticides through the UMass Extension Service. So if you, you could contact her too, Lauren, um, if you hey. want. And her name is Natalia Clifton, N-A-T-A-L-I-A -A Clifton, C-L-I-F-T-O-N. But her area of expertise is pesticides. Thank you. Is, so, should it still be due um, by this month or? What? Well, do you want to have, do you think you'll have a draft of, an, of the uh, updated regulations for our May or June meeting or June meeting? May, I think June is fine, but I just don't know how the, the old regulation just seemed very vague to me. So I don't know how. I, I feel like it should be more specific, but I'm not sure how specific or if there's any direction. That One the, thing I've done is I've looked at other towns' uh, regulations to see when they were updated and how they compare to ours. Does anyone else have any advice that they can give Lauren? I no? agree with that. I found that useful in looking at the regulations I've reviewed and it just helps to give it a, a breadth of what what's out there um, and maybe some ideas for improvement of our old regulations. Okay. And Tim has um, a lot of expertise too. Mm -hmm. Tim, maybe we shouldn't wait till June. <laughs> yeah. We've had a it's, lot of time. It's fine. I don't know. We'll see. Okay, so that's fine. May okay. 5th is very is right around the corner. <laughs> I know. Okay. Yeah. So uh, June so June 9th. June 9th is fine. I put this on the agenda last year when I just went through and looked at all our regulations, because that's that's what we do as regulations. And I looked at the dates that they had been reviewed. Uh, and it's to review and revise if they're needed, or you can review them and say we're happy with the way they are. It, I just put them on so that we mm -hmm. can act on them and not have a um, a regulation that's there for 15 years without anybody looking at it. Right. I think they, uh, the, the, you know, the basic framework for the draft was using many of the um, uh, laws in, or the regulations in other towns especially mm -hmm. coastal towns and so uh, so many were there I think uh, just to uh, you know in terms of specificity there are thousands and thousands of chemicals <laughs> we are living <laughs> live in an environment where there is you know I, I would say thousands you know uh, you know consuming and exposed to but I think uh, having uh, you know guidance from those types of regulations which actually look at commonalities and uh, uh, in, in making the regulations you know we are not going to regulate and measure and monitor every regulation uh, we impose you know so that's that's uh, but I think it giving guidance to protect the public health mm -hmm. with some sort of a basic fundamental rules at the public spaces that's that's where I think we are focusing on so, that's uh, right that's right and when we looked at the regulation a few years ago, we found out that the town hardly ever used, um, I, I think there's two incidences in the last like 10 years where they used Roundup as a last resort on um, poison ivy. I think it was at Groff Park 
and or Mill River where they hand pulled it and it kept coming back. So they used it a very small amount on a very specific patch of poison ivy. So the town is not using these chemicals to, to any extent uh, that we reviewed uh, and talked about a few years ago. So that was good to know. Okay, so June. So um, any other comments on toxic chemicals? Uh, the community assessment, I'm really excited about this. Um, so phase one, which are the demographics. Oops, this... <laughs> My watch is talking, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, the two students, um, Emily Connors and um, Bailey, and all of a sudden I'm blanking her, her last name, um, are doing an amazing job with the demographics using the census data that's just coming out and different vital statistic reports. Unfortunately, a lot of the vital statistic reports are already 10 years old. And a lot of the vital statistics of diseases and chronic illnesses um, come just by the county. And none of it do we have access to race and ethnicity in, in that data. So at our May 5th, and the reason we're having this meeting on May 5th, because the following week is their graduation in the School of Public Health Thursday afternoon and evening. So they're not available at our usual time. And they will present their data. Um, and I will have hopefully the report out to you so that you have it during their presentation um, on May 5th. And um, so what I've done is I've also divided the rest of the community assessment into two additional phases. So phase two, which is really most of it is quantitative data on the social determinants of health. Um, and Emily is going to do that over the summer as part of her practicum. And after her schoolwork is done, she is gonna spend a morning at the health department to get a sense of the health department. And she will be collecting and have a written report and give us the, that data for phase two at uh, probably our September or October meeting. Then the qualitative phase, which is the words and the stories about health and public health and um, people's concerns about it would be phase three that I'm calling now using mixed methods to collect qualitative data um, for the community assessments. And Emily is going to take that on because what she is, is she's called a four plus one master's student. She's graduating, getting her bachelor of science in May. And because she's an honor student and applied for this program, she completes her master's degree in one year rather than two years. Um, and so this will be her project. And we are gonna recruit other students to work with her. And this is using, um, interviews, focus groups, listening sessions, and anything else. And this is the qualitative data that we are going to be doing. And then she will put the whole everything together. Um, I also met with Earl Miller briefly last week in his welcoming cup of joe. And I'm gonna connect with um, Cress and invite them to listen to our public health um, community assessment and then also invite them to our June meeting to talk about CRESS and what they're doing and how we can um, connect um, our de our, the departments and the board. Um, so do you have any questions for me? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, for the phase two, um, the, the student, um, mm -hmm. you said she's um, gathering quantitative data and um, can you just 
like say where the data is coming from or okay so the quantitative data a lot of it is coming from existing reports so for let's see and she will be calling or interviewing or emailing people for some. So if you have the data collective collection tool, she will be getting housing characteristics. And um, a lot of that will come from the um, census tract and other things such as the total units, how many are owner occupied, renter occupied, the median house price, um, housing subsidies, homeless provisions, um, apartment complexes, the number of low income apartments, and that's just the numbers. Then income, and that she'll get from the, the census data, employment you get from the census data, and then she will identify the leading workplaces and industries in the major employers in, in Amherst. Transportation, recreation, education she'll get from DESE, which is the Department of Elementary and Secondary Schools and interviews, but that data is collected um, by the Department of Education statewide. Um, places of worship, library services, and law enforcement, our fire department, the major forms of communication in town, um, our water supply, sewage, land policies. She'll list the healthcare service providers um, and then an overview of government and policy making. So it's really more how things are done. Then the qualitative is using key informant interviews. This will be phase three focus groups, surveys, descriptions of from people in the community of uh, who's important, uh, what are some of the most serious issues related to health in town? What are some of the services that are most needed in the community? Who needs them? Are people taking advantage of services that exist? What are the community's significant assets? How can they be strengthened? What are some of the deficits in our town or weaknesses? And um, who should be involved in any uh, um, coalitions or moving forward with the whole idea of finding out what are the community's assets and resources, what seem to be the community's biggest challenges, what's the most striking thing about the community and what was most unexpected. Does that give you yes. an overview? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So that's where you'll be very important in this phase three. And you'll hear in May uh, the data and, and you'll get a picture. They're collecting it by census tract um, in town. Any other questions? So I'm looking forward to you seeing their work and meeting them via Zoom because they've really been amazing amazing um, help to doing this. Okay, so new business. The first item is the center um, east way for the subdivision um, that Christine from planning brought forth and Jennifer and I met with her in March and we looked at, and I walked by several times the, the parcels. And I had a lot of questions about the effect on the water table, storm infiltration. The, the project says that they'll identify um, environmental protection measures, I had uh, questions about the size of the drive for emergency vehicles, trash collection. I also thought about if these are businesses or, or offices, 
and people park on Gray Street, will that leave enough room for emergency vehicles or school buses to go up and down Gray Street? And I said, oh my, I'm over my head. And I sent all this to Tim because he is the most expert on our board. And um, I don't see anyone from planning here. Um, I'm, but I'm here. Tim. I'm yeah. planning. Oh, I'm okay. Chris. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Chris, your name didn't um, come up. Um, here. I'm oh, sorry. So I don't know if Chris, you want to talk again yeah, no, that you came up as a panelist, not as an attendee. Sorry. And um, Nancy, yeah. that, this is Jennifer. I'm just going to jump in that we have John here as the property owner and okay. an, an invitation to uh, attorney Tom Reedy was sent. I don't see him here, okay. um, but Thank um, you, yeah, okay. thanks so much. Okay, yeah, I was looking at Jen attendees versus panelists, sorry. Yeah, see, <clears throat> before you start, I, uh, we got a bunch of stuff and it was, uh, I didn't know what it was about. And there was no explanation, but one of the things was a list of questions about it. Was that what you were referring to? Maybe Tim did that or there was an extensive list of questions. I just wonder who said, asked those, where did they come from? That, that document was from Tim. Okay, well, yes. thanks, Tim, Th but... Thank you. I'm not sure I saw that, so. Mm -hmm. I can send it again. I think it was in the packet, Maureen. But okay, I yeah, I have a yeah. lot of things in that packet. But there was a lot. <laughs> I could have missed it. The question, yeah, there was the question <laughs> that um, definitely I missed it. Would you Is send it, it to me? Uh, excuse me, would you send it to me also? I don't think I saw that. I didn't look in the packet. I, I wasn't expecting to look in the packet. Yes, Christine. I see 11 questions. Is that what you guys are talking about? Huh, I don't know how I missed that. Some observation based on mass GIS. The subdivision plan comments is the title of it. Yeah, I, yes. I have. Uh, Here. The yeah, it says here are some observations and questions. Yeah, I did. I, I missed that somehow. So, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, then, I, and it, it has the picture, uh, the aerial view from GIS of, of the site. Um, and so those were Tim's um, questions uh, and observations uh, um, after he reviewed all that data that's the beginning of that you got that we got that I looked at and then walked by the property and said oh I have these questions and uh, as we said we met with um, Christine uh, Jennifer and I met with Christine and then um, I sent this all off to Tim so I think let's see Christine, do you want to present um, from the planning board and, and talk about why you sent all this to the Board of Health? Yes, I'd like to give an introductory statement. And I see that Tom Reedy, Attorney Tom Reedy, is in the um, attendees. And uh, it would be helpful if you brought him over because he uh, will also have a lot to say, I'm sure. But why don't I start with an opening statement? Um, so the applicant in the case of this uh, definitive subdivision plan is John Robleski, and he's here with us tonight mm -hmm. as a panelist. And he's filed um, <clears throat> both a preliminary subdivision plan uh, and, and followed by a definitive subdivision plan in order to freeze the zoning on his property at uh, 462 and 446 Main Street. Um, the zoning was changed in the fall of 2021. And Mr. Robleski had already had a, a plan and an idea about how he wanted to develop his property before then. Um, the, the zoning bylaw that went through that was uh, approved by the town council changed the regulations with regard to mixed use buildings. So in the past mixed use buildings, which are a combination of residential use and um, commercial or retail or other types of use um, didn't really have too much, too many criteria about 
how much space needed to be devoted to both of the different uses. And so Mr. Robleski built a building at 462 Main Street, which you're probably both fam all familiar with. It's a, it's a new um, blue kind of um, New England style building. It has 24 apartments in it and a, a small office building. And that building was approved a couple of years ago based on the, um, the existing zoning bylaw for mixed use buildings. Um, and then Mr. Robleski had an idea that he wanted to um, purchase 4 446 Main Street and do a similar type of building on that property. So he went ahead and purchased that property, but then um, the town changed the zoning with regard to mixed use buildings. So um, prior to the fall of 2022, as I said, there had been no criteria with regard to mixed use buildings. After the fall, um, the criteria included that the ground floor needed to include um, at least 30% of the floor area as non-residential use. So in other words, a, a store or a um, restaurant or an office or something like that. Um, as I said, Mr. Robleski, which wishes to build an excuse building similar to the building that he's already built at 462 Main Street. So he, he isn't planning to, or doesn't want to have 30% of the ground floor be um, non-residential. Um, in sometime this winter, I think it was in January, um, the planning board approved a preliminary subdivision plan with recommendations for uh, some changes um, for Mr. Robleski's subdivision. And now the planning board is reviewing the definitive subdivision plan. They had their first meeting a couple of weeks ago and they're having another meeting. I think it's on May 4th. Um, now, Mr. Robleski isn't planning to build the definitive subdivision plan. He's merely using it as a vehicle to freeze the zoning. What it allows him to do is, um, because he's filed these uh, plans at a proper time in a proper sequence, um, <clears throat> he has the ability, if he gets this plan approved by the planning board, to freeze the zoning for a period of eight years. And that would give him time to build his new building. Um, so the planning board, as I said, is reviewing um, both the definitive subdivision plan that you're looking at tonight, and soon they'll be reviewing a plan for a mixed use building. Um, even though Mr. Robleski isn't proposing to build the subdivision that you are going to be reviewing, um, the planning board and the planning department are treating the application seriously. Um, and requiring that the applicant provide the necessary information as required in the rules and regulations governing the subdivision of land of the town of Amherst. Um, just as, the same as if he were going to build the subdivision. So um, the planning board is taking it seriously. We're taking it seriously. We wanna make sure that the uh, Board of Health takes it seriously. Um, but I wanted to mention the fact that normally uh, the scope of um, review of the Board of Health on a subdivision um, has to do with water and sewer. And um, in most towns or many towns in Massachusetts, um, they don't have public water and sewer. So they have to have on-site wells and on-site septic systems. And those things are very um, important to the Board of Health to review those and make sure that they work properly. In this case, there's no proposal to have on-site wells or on-site septic since um, anything that's built on Mr. Robleski's property would have town water and town sewer. So, um, so from that standpoint, uh, there's, there's not um, that crucial piece for the Board of Health to review. Um, you can look at the plans and see what Mr. Robleski is proposing for uh, his water line and his sewer line. And I did notice tonight that um, the rules and regs governing the subdivision of land require that an eight inch sewer line be um, used for the main trunk line. In Mr. Robleski's case, he's proposing a six inch sewer line. So that's something that you might wanna ask him to change on his plan. But other than that, I, I haven't seen anything um, amiss with regard to either the sewer or the water uh, that's being proposed. So that's really the end of my um, statement and I'm here to answer questions. I also wanted to suggest that um, Mr. Reedy, who's Mr. Robleski's attorney, who's here tonight, uh, he had submitted a letter to the Board of Health 
asking for an extension to the 45 day review period. Um, the rules and regulations governing the subdivision of land try to be fair to both the town and um, the applicant. And so they put these time frames on all of the reviews. They don't want towns to drag out their reviews so that a developer can't build what he's proposing to build. So they say the Board of Health has 45 days in which to review a, uh, a subdivision plan and give its recommendations to the planning board. Um, because of uh, kind of a, a little mix up in my department and not getting the plans to you soon enough, um, you are now reviewing this a little, a little bit late in the picture. And so um, Mr. Reedy has asked that you give him an extension of that 45 day review period. The 45 days would have elapsed on April 3rd. And here we are on, um, what is this, April 21st. So that might be something that you want to vote on to agree that you have extended the 45 day review period. Um, and uh, let's see, did I have anything else to say? Oh yes, once you're finished with your review, um, we would love to have you uh, write a report or a letter about your review to the planning board. So they have a document that says that the Board of Health has reviewed this definitive subdivision plan and here are the recommendations that you have to the planning board. Um, and the planning board is required to act within 90 days of the application being filed. So they're on a deadline to, um, to react to this plan by May 18th, unless Mr. Obaleski um, requests or grants the planning board an extension of that period of time. So I guess that's, that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Does anyone have questions for Christine? Uh, yes, Christine, could you just clarify a couple of times you said that Mr. Roblevsky is not planning to build, but then at one point you said he is planning to build later, which is it? Oh, he's not planning to build the subdivision. So the sub, a subdivision is a roadway. You probably know this already, but it's really a roadway with um, all of the utilities that are required that would be in the roadway. And then um, a division of the property around the roadway so that each property has the proper amount of frontage and the proper amount of lot area. Now, Mr. Robleski is not planning to build a roadway into his property with lots, individual lots surrounding the road. What he's planning to do is um, actually combine the two lots that he has, 462 and 446 Main Street, and build a new building on sure. okay. what Got is it. now 446 Main. And so he would have essentially three buildings. He'd have an existing, uh, an existing mixed use building, which used to be the Spanish uh, Cultural Center or Study Abroad or whatever it was. And then he's got his blue building, which is next to the railroad tracks. And now he wants to build a new building, but this is not a subdivision. It's actually it. just a mixed use building development. Um, I had a few comments and questions. Um, I'm glad that this is coming up, the connection between the planning board and the um, board of health because I feel like um, that although there may be like one particular person on the board of health that is um, has expertise in this I feel that there has to be adequate time for all of the members to review things and also you know from what I'm seeing why we're discussing this is because um, it has to do, like you said, with water and sewer. And I would just, can you still hear me? Yes. And so I just, um, you know, I'm a little concerned that one, we're, we're not reviewing it in a, a manner that will give us, you know, a thoughtful decision. And also, you know, would the, the owner of this property, would they, you know, perhaps change their mind and want to, you know, build a subdivision in the future. Like I'm, I'm just, I'm just feeling that there has to be more of a, um, a second approval to what the Board of Health approves or you know reviews as far as like any kind of water and sewer changes. Um, 
So that's just my first initial thought. I guess I had a question. Will this come back around when the plans change or it won't because it's not going to be an actual um, subdivision and it's going to be a mixed use building that has different regulations and we won't be involved? May I answer that? Yes. So when we receive an application, um, the site plan review or whatever it is, we send um, transmittals to all of the department heads. And um, so we would send a transmittal about this, about the new building to Jennifer Brown. Mm -hmm. And um, she would have the opportunity to bring it to the Board of Health if she felt that there was something about it that should be reviewed by the Board of Health. Okay. Um, otherwise she would just look at it herself and decide if she wanted to make any comments. So um, you could have the opportunity to review Mr. Robleski's actual proposal to build his new building. Um, the other thing is that the, the new building will be carefully scrutinized by um, the town engineer. Mm -hmm. um, the town engineer reviews all of the plans that come before the planning board. So, and then the planning board is going to hold public hearings on the new building. Um, they're also, as I said, holding a public hearing on the subdivision, which is not going to get built. But as I said previously, we're taking it seriously as if Mr. Robleski could indeed change his mind in the future and decide to build this subdivision. You know, we, that's kind of the way we have to look at it because it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a real thing that's been presented to us. And so, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the way we're looking at it. Thank you. Yep. Tim, do you have any comments? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I know water and sewer you mentioned, but you never mentioned the stormwater impacts. Mm -hmm. I think you, um, um, Board of Health focus on groundwater, but also on sewer systems, but uh, our septics are not, not there. But stormwater is something, uh, I, I, I'm not sure you know, if stormwater is, is a possibility for the Board of Health to be considering. I agree with you, uh, Tim, because when I looked at that and then the plan was very vague on um, what was happening and I'm looking at what happens when this water gums and there's this railroad tracks and there's other things that it can cause lots of potential problems down the line after it's built and drainage is changed and more areas are um, uh, paved and um, uh, so yes, there's this the sewer issue, but I think there are a lot of other potential safety issues, and that's what we are concerned about, um, and, and what would happen to the road um, and um, other environmental things, which would affect people's health and safety. So does that reinforce what you were trying to say? What you said to Tim? Um, yeah, I think uh, most of the subdivisions they plan for certain runoff, and so one thing is, um, of course, the plan has some sort of a capacity to have underground detention, which is nice. But having no uncertain, I mean, certainty about uh, what will happen in the in in terms of those lots being developed in the future, if there's going to be a lot of impervious cover, that's going to create more runoff, which essentially can influence water quality. So that's what I'm coming from in a, see how robust this, the proposal should be in terms of the stormwater runoff, which could potentially impact water quality. Thank you. May I say something about that? Mm-hmm. Um, so that was one of the things that the planning board flagged um, that um, stormwater calculations are a required part of this application. And um, Mr. Robleski had asked for a waiver of that requirement since he isn't planning to build the subdivision, but the planning department felt that was important. And so um, as part of his review, 
the planning board a couple of weeks ago, the planning board agreed that um, Mr. Robleski should provide stormwater calculations. Um, in addition to that, the new building, well, so I, I shouldn't say that. Um, so that would be for um, the roadway itself. And then if any of these lots, any of these three lots around the subdivision road were to be developed, those would actually have to be, have to go through site plan review with the planning board um, or a special permit with the zoning board of appeals. So each of those lots would have to have its own plan for stormwater management. So in addition to planning for the road itself, um, there would be a plan for each of the, of the lots, but that those plans would come in the future. So um, the, the Board of Health could certainly um, request a copy of the stormwater calculations for the roadway, if that's something that you felt was um, important. We're, we're going to be receiving that. And so, you know, we could say that you would receive it too. Thank you. Tim, anything follow up? So I, I, I know that these, some of those observations which I listed didn't reach the planning board. I, it didn't reach us. No. Yeah, so I, I think I, I made some comments. Uh, some of them are, may not be you know, important, but uh, about uh, drainage itself, uh, the proximity to um, or distances to, I just calculated some distances to uh, environmental justice communities, uh, traffic for um, access to some large trucks. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, those are uh, something, and I would like to the planning board to actually consider. And it's also in a um, high corrosive area um, for concrete. So, what type of uh, um, mitigation they will have in terms of uh, concrete structures and stuff like that. So uh, I'm sure you know the planning, uh, the engineer will account for all those specific aspects in terms of what parameters are going to be there. But right now with the information provided, it's not clear for us, you know. So, but I just listed so those observations there, you know. It's a high drainage area. That means there's going to be a lot of infiltration. Um, uh, if, if there is, uh, uh, potential impervious cover which is going to be very high because we are not sure how much uh, rooftop and new parking lots are going to come. It's not very clear. I, I think you cleared it up, Christine, that uh, it's going to, there's going to be additional requirements for at the lot scale to have this stormwater calculations and mitigation. Um, can I just clarify um, a with a question? Um, you said that the owner is freezing the uh, the development to build right now. So, is it possible just to repeat that again? He's freezing the zoning, and what that means is that um, the zoning will remain the same as it was last fall. Mr. Robleski submitted his preliminary subdivision plan before the town council voted to change the zoning. Um, so that was the first step he took. And then that preliminary subdivision plan was reviewed and approved by the planning board. And then he submitted his definitive subdivision plan within, I think it's within seven months of the preliminary is what the requirement is. So he did that. And now we're in the review process for that. So he, is, um, he has essentially frozen the zoning, assuming that he gets approval um, for this definitive subdivision plan, which is kind of like a ticket to freeze the zoning. And it freezes it for eight years. That means that the zoning remains on his property the same way that it was back in, you know, like November or October of last year. And he gets to go by the old zoning rather than the new zoning. Any other questions? Should we open it up to Mr. Reedy or Mr. Robleski? Do they want to say anything? 
Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of Mr. Robleski. Uh, I think Ms. Brestrup, I think Ms. Brestrup did a wonderful job of, of explaining um, you know, why we're here, what Mr. Robleski is really looking to do. Um, we don't disagree that it should be taken seriously. What we're trying to do is let folks know that Mr. Robleski has no intention to build this. It's really just, it's, it's the vehicle to freeze the zoning because of the mixed use change because of the location of this property. That uh, obviously should not impact, you know, your questioning, um, or, or meeting the requirements. We're doing it, frankly, out of transparency so that folks don't think he is looking to actually build a subdivision there. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to show you the plans, walk you through the plans. I think, you know, and I'll defer to Ms. Brestrup if the next step is, you know, once you get enough comments from the board, maybe fashion a letter and suggest to the planning board here are some of the things they should include as conditions. If the Board of Health needs additional information before they're willing to do that, we're ready to do that. You know, let us know and, and we're happy to provide you that additional information. So we're happy to answer questions um, as they come up, but I think Ms. Brushup did a wonderful job um, summarizing. Thank you. Okay, Tim, do you want to take the lead? Uh, do we want to discuss writing a letter um, to the planning board with our concerns? Um, I'm, I'm leaning on you a lot, Tim. <laughs> sure. Um, I can draft, you know, I mean, I can draft it based on the questions I have, the 11 questions. Uh, which can be forwarded to the planning board. Uh, some questions also can, you know, has to come from uh, from the plan itself, um, which the owner is proposing. And so, yeah, I, I'll be glad to do that. So board members, what would you like us to do now? Well, I guess we, we're supposed to <clears throat> validate the timing because we're already mm -hmm. past the deadline and obviously right. we need to give that extension and then uh there's a small issue of the pipe being not big enough and those are two things that at some point we've got to resolve and if i may madam chair you know so the, the board of health actually has to approve or disapprove and so it sounds like you could a um to mr george's point vote take a vote to affirm or accept the request for extension, extending the time, and then vote to approve conditioned upon, you know, uh, compliance with the planning board rules and regulations, which is that eight inch water line. And then after you condition it, maybe go through a recommendation list um, that, that Tim had mentioned. And then you can list, you know, whether it's the 11 items that, that he had, uh, maybe if Ms. Mills, Ms. Mills had any questions or comments for recommendations, then those can all go to the planning board for their consideration. And so it would be an approval with a condition and then recommendations. Uh, approval with, what did you say? Approval condition. with? With condition. Okay. So the condition would be the compliance the with the subdivision and then that, that eight inch sewer line. And then recommendations that okay. Tim had mentioned, and then whatever else yeah. the conversation brings. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Seeing that we've never done this before. Yeah, at all. <laughs> okay. And also, vote to accept the um, lengthening of the review period. Yeah, that's that will be our first. Right. Or we could do that and ask for more information and deal with this at the next meeting, which is May fifth. I mean, that's. I don't know if if all of this has to happen. I know we have to extend the time and we want to, you know, make a decision on this, you know, promptly. But uh, if we had, more, I don't know if, it, if, if getting more information that's supposed to be available soon would um, help us to make a decision. But the point is, decision the, next time. the point is, this plan is not going to be 
I know, but we have to assume that, well, yes. maybe, oh, this is such a good idea. Why don't I just do it? I mean, that, okay. I don't expect okay. that to so, happen. But. Okay, so <laughs> number one, let us vote on and may have a motion to extend um, the date of the review. Um, Christine, when do we want this review, this extension to? I need your help on that. Well, if you're, it depends on if you're going to um, act tonight and make a vote to approve with conditions, then you would just extend it to today, I think. And then you would have a letter following, you know, that would describe what went on tonight. But if like Miss uh, Malia want, wants or is suggesting to do that you want a, some extra time to think about this and you're going to um, take it up again on May 5th, then you would vote to extend the time till sometime probably to May 5th. Yeah, it's just another thought. I, I, I don't know how we want to do this. Well, I, I just feel like we're, for the past couple of meetings, there's been certain items on the agenda where we've had to make a quick decision where I feel like we haven't um, necessarily had all the information that we needed. And if the if the zoning is frozen now from just from what my understanding, my limited understanding, if the zoning is frozen now and he has eight years of that same, same, of, uh, as you said, that, that he has eight years for it to remain how it is, then why, why do we have to extend, you know, his request right now? Because of the review period, we, we're past the review period. It's what we're extending is the review yeah. period, not the, not the change in the zoning. But couldn't he just reapply for, a, and I'm sorry if I sound very incoherent, but couldn't he just reapply instead of an extension? So, Madam Chair, if I could just to um, yeah. So Ms. Mills, how this, that for, for, sure, yeah, so this yeah. is, this is all statutory. So there's um, statutory requirements for filing in order to free zoning. So we filed a preliminary subdivision plan, which doesn't come before the Board of Health. And then we followed up within seven months with a definitive subdivision plan, which does come before the Board of Health. And the statutory section says, the, the planning board has a certain number of days to review and give their either approval or disapproval. If it's an approval, then there's an endorsement. If there's an endorsement, that's when the zoning freeze starts for those eight years. If there's a disapproval, then the applicant has the ability to appeal. So that's with the planning board, that 90 days. The board of health has 45 days from that filing of the definitive plan to either mm -hmm. approve or disapprove. Just because to Ms. Breastrup's earlier point, uh, the law wants to be fair to both the town and the applicant. So if there's inaction, the applicant has the ability to do something about it, like appeal or pursue in court. Um, mm -hmm. But the town has sufficient time in order to, to review it. So the 45 days was up at the beginning of April, but mm -hmm. because the, the Board of Health you know, we didn't deliver the plan to the Board of Health. Planning Board didn't deliver the plan to the Board of Health. So the Board of Health didn't have it. And so you weren't able to review it. And so we said as the applicant, and, you know, Ms. Brestrup had suggested, why don't we give some additional time for the Board of Health to review it? And so I sent in a letter saying, could we have, could you have some more time? Just because I think if you don't act, it's deemed a denial, which then puts us into a predicament where we have to then sue the town to, to perfect it because you can't go back to like the only way to keep the zoning freeze going if it's denied is to appeal it, which is, it doesn't make sense really for every, anybody. So. May I interrupt just for a minute? According so to the planning board, planning board rules and regs governing subdivision of land, failure of the board of health to report shall be deemed approval by the board of oh, health. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> well, let it lapse. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, there you go. So, I mean, you're, I, it obviously behooves the Board of Health to uh, allow the extension of their time to review so it's not deemed an approval. 
And okay. so that's all we're talking about is, is for the board of health to approve or disapprove, you know, approve with conditions is really what we're asking for here. Mm -hmm. So that's, and the eight years doesn't start until after Mr. Robleski gets through this whole process, then the eight oh, years start. So that clock hasn't okay. even started yet. Okay. All right, anyone have any other comments? I think it really, <clears throat> since this is the first time many of us ever even heard of this, and it's fairly complex, I hope it would be just held over to the, the next meeting, which is very soon, and do the conditional approval, do all that stuff then. Because otherwise, I could not stand up and explain to my neighbors why we did something if we did it tonight. I, I, I just don't feel so. Okay, so I'm going to make a motion that we move this, we give the extension, we move this to our May meeting with the idea that we will give a, an approval with the condi condition on the sewer line that has to be eight eight inches versus six inches, and that we will make some recommendations using Tim's um, list of questions. I second it. So it's been moved and seconded. Did you get it, Steve, that we move it to our May meeting with the idea that we give a, an approval with the condition on the sewer line being eight inches, not six inches. And then that we will look at the recommendations that Tim has given and we will list them in that letter that we will then draft and send out after our May meeting, our May, May, fifth. May, 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 fifth meeting. Good. Okay. So that is the motion and has been seconded. Uh, I'd like a vote on it. Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Steve? Aye. Lauren? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Okay. So does that? That's, that's great. And if you, you know, whether you, you Madam Chair, or, or Tim wants to put some of those questions in writing and, and get them to Ms. Brestrup and to us, we may be able to provide you some additional information like the, the stormwater management report, HydroCAD, et cetera. So that might nip it in the bud a little bit about some of the questions that you may have. So if you want to put those in writing and get them to us, then we might be able to provide you information ahead of that meeting. Okay. We have them in writing. Tim, do you mind sending them to Christine Bestrup? I, yes. I, sent, I sent them about 45 minutes ago. Okay. So they've been sent. Okay. Okay. So thank you, everybody. And this is the first time in uh, 18 years that I've ever known that the board has done this. So thank you, everybody, for getting us through that. And we'll follow up on our May meeting so everybody will have time to review everything. Perfect. See you in a couple Thank weeks. You. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so Mosquito Control and Tanning Salon is going to be moved to our May meeting. Oh man, our May meeting is something else. Um, and uh, the solar bylaw regulations we had a request for a member from the town manager to be on this. And we sent out a request and nobody volunteered to be on this. And I'd like to discuss that. And one thing that I wanna go on record for is that I think it's important that the health department be involved in this because uh, citing of solar arrays can affect groundwater and wells. And the point I wanna make is that the health department's infrastructure is non-existent. We have Jennifer Brown, who's amazing, who's covering the health director, the public health nurse. We have 12 hours of Nancy Schroeder, who does a lot of work for us. And then we have Lillian, who is here for two years under um, ARP money. So we really do not have a public health infrastructure to help us uh, look at solar bylaw regulations and um, have the health department um, do this 
and present information to the board for us to act on it. So I, I, I want to go on record um, saying that we do not have the necessary public health infrastructure for us to work efficiently um, for the town in supporting issues related to public health and public, uh, public health safety um, because we have no infrastructure. So I don't know, uh, I wanted to open this up for discussion, comments or thoughts, but I thought this was a place for the board to um, have comments on this, the lack of public health infrastructure in the town of Amherst and that we cannot um, participate because of, of, of lack of personnel uh, in the solar, solar bylaw regulations. Um, opening it up for comments. So what did you think when you got that request? <clears throat> well, I, you know, I would say that that's a very complicated thing. I read all of the things that they were supposed to do and I have no expertise in any of it. Um, the one thing, Nancy, I agree with everything you say about the lack of infrastructure, but they didn't request somebody from this professional staff. They wanted somebody from the Board of Health. Mm -hmm. So in the past, when we had other directors and more staff, the health department would help the board go through this. Yes. And so we do not have the help from the health department for a board member to do any of this. And in the past, there was the infrastructure that, that the, the, the health department could support the board in doing this work. Um, can I make a comment? Sure. <laughs> um, I, I think that that we're finding now that the need to collaborate and maybe uh, have liaisons from one committee or board to another. And I don't know the exact name of the committee, but they were dealing with the water levels and the um, aquifers. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of scientists on, I, I think they met once a month or maybe less than, maybe just three times a year, but was a special uh, committee um, uh, that was looking at the, the new, um, the needs of the, the water um, and, and how, in, in the town of Amherst. And so I'm just saying that if it's not a, a board of health member, would it be possible to ask some of these other um, more um, expert scientists who, who, know as, who know about, you know, solar and who may know, you know, another important um, area is the water table and, you know, water health in the town. So if, board members are not able to fill those positions, maybe we could ask for liaisons from, from another you know, department who would have the expertise and hopefully the time. Other comments? My, my only concern is the time. Mm -hmm. uh, they haven't represent, I mean, they haven't mentioned about how frequently, what is the commitment, um, what are they expecting from the Board of Health, you know, and, and I mean, I mean uh, solar installations are some sort of a new area of, uh, and, and I think, of course, and I think that will be a, a huge uh, uh, benefit they could get from Board of Health participating, but I think uh, my hesitation to commit anything is purely based on what is expected. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Yeah, so, I felt the same as Steve, that it just was an overwhelming like issue that I know zero about and to educate myself enough to make any sense of that would be I I just couldn't imagine it honestly to you know I 
I could get some general impressions, but the idea of really looking at something and really with a critical eye, I, I have no experience or knowledge in that area. And um, I don't, you know, is this, is this an area where the town hires a consultant or, you know, to be active on their behalf? I, I, I just don't know how, how this can be managed in, in a town like this. Um, it is a very important, a very important issue, both to build solar uh, energy sites, but also to protect the uh, other infrastructure in the town. I agree. Other comments? I wanted to use this time um, for the board to, to get uh, some of the issues out so that that they're out in the public um, because we are a volunteer board this is a very serious um, concern um, solar um, is is much needed to get away from fossil fuels because of the effect on climate health um, the environment um, the effects on health um, and yet the siting of solar um, ha has also effects on where it is, water quality, def if we're doing deforestation, the effect on the environment, the health, the water. And I do think that uh, someone with a health background needs to be on um, this committee, but I don't think a board of health member has the time or expertise uh, and, and not knowing what are the expectations. And likewise, we have no public health infrastructure so that someone from the board of health, I mean, the health department be on that committee either. So I, I, I wanted that to, to, to get out. I don't know what other people think about that, but I thought this would be a forum um, to get our concerns about that out. I, I don't know what your thoughts are. You're shaking your head, Maureen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't seem to have, again, it's an unknown, like, amount of time and energy that mm -hmm. that's involved. But also there's the, the, the health department itself is very, very slim and doesn't have the resources to, to do anything like that. Uh, and, the, and the board is pressed as well with, full-time jobs on some of us and knowledge on, <laughs> on, on others. Um, it, it also says the purpose is to draft a solar zoning, zoning bylaw, including standards and guidelines that will guide and encourage responsible development of solar installations, including battery storage. And there's seven voting members, and it seems like they want members from five particular um, committees and then to residents and but there's no liaison so it it seems like if you're on this this committee then you'll be you know you'll be doing it's, it's not like you can just go and listen or something like that but you have to be involved mm -hmm. and vote Tim, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I, as I was mentioning, I think it's not clear on the resources they are expecting. And I, I mean, the committing uh, committing time, how many meetings, you know, what type of outcomes, and uh, I mean, those are some of the concerns. It's not very clear for. Uh, And since we are, as, as Maureen was saying, you know, we're slim, trying to deal with a lot of other issues, you know, this is additional workload yeah. coming in, you know, so. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think at this point, any of the board members have the time or the expertise given that we don't know the time commitment or uh, what are the expectations 
of us on, on it. So um, we'll, we'll, if no one has any other comments, we'll leave it that, at that. But I thought we could use this forum to get um, th the need for better public health infrastructure um, uh, known um, because uh, we have Jen, we have Jen Brown who's doing an amazing job and she's covering being the health director, the nurse. And if you look at other health departments uh, of comparable sizes in our area, they have uh, uh, much more, uh, many more members and more support. Um, and Nancy Schroeder and Lillian do an amazing job, but Nancy Schroeder's 12 hours a week to the health department and Lillian is there for two years and that's it. So that's our infrastructure. Thank you. Um, we're going to not have the directors update um, because of, of the, the today's situation um, and Jenna's not available. Um, we'll do that uh, in May. Um, I don't think we were prepared to vote on the mask um, mandate at, at this point. Um, we can open it up for further public comment um, at this point. So I don't know, Carol, Carol Gray, uh, Jen, can you let her in um, if, for public comment? Hello, it's Hi. me again. <laughs> um, no. So, so um, I would just um, urge you to reconsider. And I know that maybe this isn't on the. Actually, I didn't catch what this is on the agenda for. Um, you could. If you don't agree with me that we should save lives and have a mask mandate until the end of the school year, maybe you could say that for gatherings over a hundred people inside require a mask mandate because like literally like we know of a dozen kids, close to a dozen that got, that got sick from that play and it's happening on April 29th again and there will be more kids and each one of them brings it home to who knows how many vulnerable family members. I just don't see any harm to requiring masks for crowds of a hundred indoors. Like it, it's just gonna save lives. And, and just till the end of the school year, get us through. Um, by the way, I heard that before you guys lifted the mask mandate, some people, a restaurant owner in particular came and gave you guys a really hard time and was very disrespectful. And, and when I heard that, I was like, you know, we should have been going to those meetings. They should know that the vast majority of the town supports this. We, like, I was so pleased that we were from a town that was intelligent and wanted to save our lives. And that was the priority. And I just don't, Philadelphia just did this. You're not like out there on a limb, you know, Yukon just did it. Uh, uh, there's there's uh, this okay. is this is the safe trend thank you okay, okay thank you carol um back back to board members um i don't think we're prepared to to take an action on the mask mandate we could write a letter to the superintendent um about gatherings with especially singing and people opening up their lungs and spreading about, I don't know, can someone make any comments or thoughts of what they have? Because we did get in our pack, a packet, a letter from another parent who was concerned because of um, the, um, spread of COVID after um, the musical and that they did cancel one performance because of the spread of COVID within the school um, and especially people that were involved with the musical. Are any of you following that? Or uh, I didn't hear about that, but I, I want to pass be, uh, what do they say, um, transparent? Um, it, because this, 
the public health, I mean, the public comment, um, the, the situation has happened in the school. First, I would have spoken, and I'm not sure if it has already been done, but spoken with the, the superintendent. And so I'm just, I feel like we can't, you know, you can't, um, it's like ripping a Band-Aid off and then trying to put the same Band-Aid back on. It just like, just feels like there's one anecdotal person, you know, stating what, what has recently happened in, in their um, child's life and in their family. But I, I feel like there hasn't been a complete picture and the data that, you know, and the, the measures that we have been using to, you know, see where COVID cases are rising and so forth in Amherst, to me, it's, it has to now be specific. And first, you know, I feel like we need to go to the, the, the place where um, incidents may be, be more prevalent to, you know, more COVID cases. But if, you know, what, what, if we're being influenced by, you know, this current um, situation, I, I feel that we need to have more, you know, input and, and, and understanding of what is, what is the administration in the school doing? I, I, I feel like it's a lot of pressure to say that we, we have the responsibility of saving people's lives. I just, I feel like, you know, those comments are putting a lot of pressure on us as a board and I, I don't think that's fair. So I just, I just, you know, I, I feel like there has to be some transparency in, in how, you know, we are, you know, dealing with this on a personal level, but also as a board, um, I just, I just feel like there has to be more specific um, understanding of like, if this is happening in schools, what, what do we do if it's, you know, if it's um, COVID cases are rising more and the college students, what do we do? I mean, I just, I just don't think we can have a broad brush and be like, okay, one particular incident and now everybody has to wear masks. Is, would it be reasonable to just think about whether Jennifer could look at the metrics and then also confer with the superintendent and decide if there are changes and incidences um, that seem to warrant the replace the masks in certain either in schools or in certain activities in schools. I, I feel like we don't have any we don't have anything to go on as a board right now. And I don't want to put the onus really all on Jennifer, but um, you know, if there's something that looks um, quite disturbing, um, although you know it, it would take some time to you could have a special meeting to discuss it or something like that. But it feels like to make a decision. It, uh, like Lauren said, uh, um, uh, very anecdotal information at this point, as far as we know, um, doesn't seem responsible. But uh, you know, but the situation, nevertheless, is concerning. Um, and you know, it seems that right now, with this new wave of of whatever it is, BA two, that the numbers of cases are going up significantly but hospitalizations aren't seeming to follow, um, which is thankful, you know, um, and there are other measures that can be taken for vulnerable people in terms of medications. Um, 
so there's there are masks are one of the measures I feel like you know and I think we need to think of all of the measures um, and not just one. Um, granted, I wouldn't really want to have COVID and take the risk of getting long COVID. I just you know there's there's this a weird disease, um, but. Again, I don't know that we have information to to vote on a, a mask mandate right now. So I agree, we can't vote on a mask mandate today. We it, it wasn't even published in our um, uh, agenda, so we have no um, input. I, I I have followed. We have had a slight rise in cases in town. I do know about the rise in school, but the, a school mask mandate is, the, we can't tell the, that's what the school committee has to do. Um, and um, so I, I agree having, um, and Jennifer has been in con communication with Mike Morris and maybe they can discuss what to do, especially if they're putting on, um, um the musical again because musicals and singing and not people with masks it's like you know sitting in a choir and singing and hope you don't get covid not knowing what's going on um so does anyone i don't know if we need to make a motion um no it doesn't seem like we do no so we'll just, uh, and, and Jennifer's on there so she can follow up and talk to Mike Morris about safety precautions, given that there was this, this uh, increase in cases in the high school because of the musical. Uh, and it seems as if what I've heard and a little bit that I've read, it, it's been connected with the musical. I, I think this is a primarily a school decision to be made um, um, especially i think i'm sure they had been following the numbers and i, I think you know I'm, I'm sure you know if, um, you know it's not just one parent but it's multiple parents involved in any type of decisions i think uh, the school committee and the superintendent should take any type of decisions if there is any type of uh, trends in the in the schools Maybe right. one thing. <clears throat> maybe one thing to add is that you know when we lifted the town in, indoor mask mandate, we said that we're going to monitor it and we're going to look at the whole picture. And we're not saying that that decision was for all time, but a lot went into that decision. It wasn't just a few extreme comments, you know, telling us how important it was to lift the mandate. It was it was a whole constellation of things. It's not entirely the science. It's just a judgment about the overall risk and how possible it is for individuals to bring that risk down for themselves, even without a, a, a legal mandate. And so I, we're going to be discussing this for a long time, given the predictions about COVID being around. And uh, But I agree, this is not the moment when we are going to do a townwide, even the large gathering indoor mask mandate. And the schools, they have the school committee and Mike Morris um, with input from the health department. Okay, any other discussion before we move on to that? Okay. So topics not anticipated by the chair, um, 48 hours before the meeting. Um, two things, one is I'm going to invite Earl Miller from the, the new Crest Department um, uh, to attend, to listen to the community health assessment because I met him and I told him that we were doing it. And then I would like to invite him and his staff to our uh, June meeting to talk about Crest and the interaction that Crest can have with the Board of Health and the Health Department. Um, so that will be in our June meeting. And then Lauren sent me an email um, today about um, racial equity um, and issues about access to culturally appropriate food, outdoor activities, um, school. And um, 
my response was, well, we really can't discuss that because you know we it's not posted on our um, agenda and following the open meeting law, but we could add um, racial equity and the role of the Board of Health. Um, to future meetings for us to um, keep that discussion open. Uh, but given that the Board of Health is really regulations, um, we have limited ways to directly act on that, but we need to, to discuss it and be open to it and, uh, and have greater understanding for um, for that, does anyone have any comments? Uh, I guess, I guess since I sent, oh, if somebody else has a comment, I'll, I can wait. No, no one else. Oh. Um, I, I guess what I was trying to say um, uh, about those bullet points is some ways to, or some topics that we could be updated on and I wouldn't mind, you know, trying to, you know, be more proactive in, you know, bringing forth any kind of, you know, updates or models that other towns are doing that might, you know, help us decide how we would like to discuss um, racial equity in healthcare. Like I said, the, um, the cult access to culture, uh, culturally appropriate food and um, just like interpersonal um, community building um, because of, you know, people being, you know, um, indoors more, you know, just that's just from my observation um, and my experience, um, people have taken on um, the 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 um, COVID measures, uh, safety measures, like you know, still being more distant and you know, still maybe being more isolated in their home, and just how 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 does how does that that isolation, how does that um, you know affect you know racial equity? Um, just like for, for people who may not be as mobile, people who may not have like a, a large, you know, community um, of folks that can support them. Like, how do we, how do we see that in an equity lens or racial equity health lens? So I just, I just wanted to, you know, figure out with, with the board, how do we, as you say, keep the discussion open on those certain topics. Comments? Other comments? Okay, no other comments. So we'll, we'll put that on uh, um, our agenda that the uh, racial equity and public health and the role of the Board of Health because um, uh, racial equity is very important, but the role of what the board does um, is 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 regulated by state regulations. So there's lots of things that can be done, but whether we as a board can do it, um, I'm not sure. But we really need to keep this discussion open and see what we can do. And I think the community assessment might help us um, in helping develop action plans for the health department. Any other comments? Okay, our next board meeting is May 5th. And part of that meeting will be the presentation by the two students on the phase one, the demographics by census tract um, with health indicators that they can, that they have been able to find. Um, and other than that, we, I'll need a 
motion to adjourn. Thank you, Tim, for all your input on the subdivision and everybody's input on all the other matters. Um, thank you. So may have a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. I'll second that. Okay. A vote. Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Steve? Aye. Lauren? Aye. And Nancy, I, and remember our next meeting is May 5th. Okay, thank you. Thank you, stay well. Bye,